It's great to be here this evening and actually to finally be having this discussion here because as I mentioned, oh, as Paula mentioned, it is five years since I first met her. In fact, to the week, I, which is a very strange anniversary, um, which will become clearer, I think. So five years ago, I was working with another designer, James King, and we were carrying this briefcase and we were off to MIT. And it was an experiment. We weren't quite sure what was going to happen. And we asked Paolo if we could come and show her. She was one of the first people to see the contents, which they have been alluded to already. But we warned her that what was inside may be surprising. It's not real. It's a design fiction. But it represents a technology that could soon be real, and parts of it are already. I believe this represents a new design space, that of living matter. I started researching synthetic biology about nearly seven years ago, and as I learned more, it became clear to me that the aim is to transform biology, to transform life into a 21st century design discipline. And I've been asking, what kind of design discipline could this be? What should it be? And what could the role of design be itself? So this suitcase kind of represents the beginning of this story for me. So if we rewind back five years ago, looking a bit younger, less tired. We're going off to this competition, iGEM, and a team of students from Cambridge University were entering the International Genetically Engineered Machines competition, which is the student synthetic biology competition, which Paola mentioned. And 15,000 students have been through it so far in the last 10 years, and it happens this weekend in Boston. The Cambridge students designed standardised sequences of DNA biobricks. This is kind of classic, traditional synthetic biology. And they inserted them into E. coli to make them produce coloured pigments like this. In fact, they made a whole spectrum of coloured pigments. And we worked with them and we came up with this name, E. chromi. But James and I weren't just there to come up with names. We wanted to see what could we do to help the students. And we ended up working with them to think about the, the potential of this technology, not its applications but its implications. We wanted to get them to think about the kind of long-term consequences, the kinds of groups and services and laws that might emerge as a result. So we designed this timeline that started um, to kind of reflect on these kinds of sort of unusual unintended consequences. So this came out of a workshop with the students. One of them, the, the favourite one, was 2039. We imagined that you could go to the supermarket and buy a probiotic yoghurt drink containing E. chromi, and you'd drink this yoghurt, and it would contain engineered bacteria that would colonise your gut, and they'd be engineered to detect the chemical signals of a variety of diseases. If they detected a disease, they'd start producing the corresponding coloured pigment. So this was a very interesting first meeting, um, because we brought coloured poo with us. And uh, Paolo was very kind about it. But um, the point, <laughs> it, was, it, was a kind of, it was a strange thing because we hadn't shown it to the scientists yet. And this was at the kind of the crux of it is we didn't know what we were doing. We were going off to iGEM to present this idea of cheap personalized disease monitoring that we could see kind of potentially disrupting healthcare as we know it. And um, it's not real. This application isn't real. It's a design fiction. And we wanted to go to iGEM and actually get conversations going with the scientists and actually start talking to the people inventing and designing the technology. This was a guerrilla design intervention to avoid paying a thousand dollars to present. Um, so it's a really strange kind of object because it was how we started conversations with the FBI agents at iGEM, the UN bioweapons um, inspector who's there as well. And we wanted to show how design could help think about the, the implications and the issues as well because we saw a really strange gap between reality and the, uh, the way that the science was being talked about, because synthetic biology is talked about in terms of engineering metaphors. And we saw the gut not only as an interesting design space and an underloved design space in synthetic biology, but also a way to talk about the complex and unique materiality of, um, of biology itself. So this project is five years old, which in synthetic biology terms is... is like super vintage, because the technology itself is 15 years or under. But coloured poo is the gift that keeps on giving. Um, so this year, Pam Silver's lab at Harvard published a paper where they engineered bacteria and fed them to mice and engineered them so they would detect and record chemical signals in the gut. The mouse poo isn't coloured, but it is the first step in making our fictional proposal, the Scatalog, reality. Who would have thought five years ago this would happen so soon? And what will synthetic biologists be designing five years from now? 
what's strange, like in reflection, is that I've seen this catalogue concept presented by scientists to other scientists, by to funding agencies and to governments all over the world over the last five years, and it's presented as a design goal. And the Silver Lab research, well, the Silver Lab itself is part funded by DARPA, the Defence Advanced Research Projects Agency. And the particular call, which is called CLEO, is calling for um, ways to be able to detect design biology in people for biosafety reasons, but also to protect American intellectual property in a global emerging bioeconomy. This century is being described as the century of biology. And for me, this issue of my, my small part and responsibility of actually maybe helping biological internal surveillance is a 21st century question for 21st century science. I've learned th the hard way that by imagining the future, even in a critical way, which was the original intention of the project, you may make that future more likely. Was E. Chromai's critique lost as it became the poster project for synthetic biology? Or was the critique actually absorbed and implemented? Was this successful design? I'm not sure of the answer. And I, it brings me to this question, which I keep on, you know, this is what I'm really interested in, is can design be more than a translator between a technology and consumer products? Can design actually help influence the path of a technology? And if so, what future is it that we want to design? So in the last five years, lots of artists and designers have started joining this space, working in and around synthetic biology, and speculating on the future using a variety of methods. And this is going to be like a really quick shopping list, so uh, apologies for whiplash. There are utopian proposals, like David's kind of uh, these really exciting design tools, imagining how we could design more sustainably. There are dystopian fictions, like this speculation where the oil supplies get infected by parasitic wasps. Um, by Tobias Ravel. They're kind of ambiguous narratives. Um, this is a, a landscape and an alternative reality which is used to produce rocket fuel to allow a rich investor to escape to space by um, Sasha Poflep. The designers who are working with real biology but that invite kind of future extrapolations about where we might go. These are really beautiful bacterial printed um, textiles, so the bacteria actually doing the printing and pattern making by Natsai Audrey Kieser. And then there's bio artists who are working with existing materials. This is um, Oren Katz and Ian Outzer and Cory Van Seis, who designed um, a protocell printing machine. So protocells are another aspect of synthetic biology, the idea that we can make life from scratch, and it hasn't been achieved yet, but they made a, a printing machine that actually speculates on what that might be like and what that might mean, this kind of ethical tool. But what's so fascinating about synthetic biology, and I apologize to my synthetic biology colleagues in the audience um, at this point, is that it's not just artists and designers who are coming up with design fictions. iGEM projects are the best example of scientific design fiction. The students create these incredibly well thought through and beautifully designed narratives and, and do part of the science. I mean, it's a three month project in general. So, you know, it, that's the realistic expectation, but they're sold in these kind of amazing world-saving narratives. Then there's the marketing of products, and you may have seen the, the Glowing Plant project last year, that um, a Kickstarter fundraising um, campaign that, that got half a million dollars to make glowing plant seeds, and funders would receive their seeds in the post, and suddenly the regulators and policy makers, you know, even Kickstarter, no one knew what to do about this because policy is so far behind and, and regulation. But the ultimate speculation is synthetic biology's vision that it's going to make the world a better place. This is the manifesto of the BioBricks um, Foundation, and I love this, the last bit, which is, this is their highlight. This is a new paradigm. But what is the paradigm? This is synthetic biology's imaginary. It shapes the field, funding follows the vision, and that's not unique to synthetic biology. I think all science is constructed in that way. You know, you, you say, we'll do this, and someone's going to help fund and make it more realistic. But with the specific dream of synthetic biology and saying that it's a sustainable green technology that can make the world a better place, my question is, well, what is that the reality? Because at the moment, synthetic biology is an industrial technology, and it's gearing up towards this trying to make the same things that we already have, like making this ambition of making fuel from sugar so that we can live in the same way as we do today. To me, what is promising to be a disruptive technology is also promising to disrupt nothing. 
So a lot of the fictions that I talked about were in the show um, Gloria Roan, which Paola mentioned. And for me, this was a really interesting a sort of experience because I was co-curating with um, a synthetic biologist and, and with designers. And this it revealed how synthetic biologists are really excited by these design fictions, but at the same time, they're really nervous of the hype that they generate. When I press synthetic biologists to say, well, what is, you know, could you detail your better vision? If this is going to change the world, what will that world look like? Or what, how does it actually work? They retreat and they say, well, and, you know, how can we speculate? A science has to evolve. You can't, you know, you can't imagine everything now. And I think it's a really fair point. You know, there's so much foundational science to be done to achieve this ambition of making biology easy to engineer. That how can we speculate? How can we imagine what it is that it, that we want or what it could be like? But that's kind of the crux of it. Is this the role of design in synthetic biology? Could it be about helping to imagine alternative visions to actually detail this future? And this is something that we explored in synthetic aesthetics over the last four years. So, I mean, it's, as Paolo mentioned it a bit, and David showed some of his work from this project. This was a really weird and wonderful project. It was an interdisciplinary experimental research project funded by science, which brought together leading synthetic biologists, artists and designers, social scientists all over the world. And we just asked this, can we design life? How might we design life? And what might it mean to design it well? So at the core of the project were these six residencies, which um, David was on, and you saw the human cheese. Um, it was my armpits that got turned into cheese. This is the problem with being in the wrong place at the wrong time with a camera. You think you're going to be, you know, you're going to be not, yeah. It was a bad day in the office. Um, but these residencies were really unusual because they spent two weeks in the lab and then two weeks in their partner's studio. And then the kind of collaborations just carried on for several years after that. But we challenge the residents just to think about what it means to design biology, what it means to design life. There was no other brief. We asked them just to crash their ways of working together and disrupt normal ways of thinking and identify new areas for questioning. And I don't have time to go into any of the projects, but um, they're all kind of detailed in the book. And what was so important about this is that each of those residencies, the projects that were somewhere between design and art and scientific research, became the lens to open up new areas for investigation. We use those projects to actually write and, and to identify new themes and questions within the science. So I think it offers a new way of working where design becomes a tool for innovation as well as for critical thinking within the lab and within the cultural context. And one of the really sort of the foundational aims of synthetic aesthetics was to build new networks and new spaces for collaboration and discussion. That's what's so exciting about this evening because synthetic aesthetics doesn't it doesn't exist anymore, but its its legacy is carrying on with this kind of continual spreading of, of discussion. And another sort of strange turn and twist of events is five years ago I you know took that brought the briefcase here to Paola with James. And this year um with, with, we're official. Um, iGEM approached me and asked if I would run an art and design competition within iGEM. And I said, no, this is a, not a good idea because it means we're siloing art and design. And how can we actually encourage collaboration? So we have a competition within it which has got engineering and art and design teams. We also have a prize that's across the whole competition. Um, so, and we have 11 teams competing for that, I think, so far, and five in the track. So this weekend, I'll see see what happens um, and whether this is a good idea, because I don't know if it is, but the mysteries continue. Um, and this kind of, to finish up, I think what's, what we really need to remember is that we're talking about designing living things and designing life. And the design of life is a really complex question and a conversation. There isn't a right answer. There's no right way of doing it, I don't think. I think it's a conversation we need to be having together. And I don't believe that design has to solve problems. I think it can ask questions and probe and make things tangible. But it's not only a matter of designing biology and how we do it well. I think it's also asking what we use design for. Because if we want to design life, what kind of life do we want? <laughs>